Okay, everyone. So um, welcome back. Uh, next up is Helen Graham from the University of Leeds and Phil Baxi from My Future York, who will uh, be speaking on heritage planning and a deliberative systems approach to local democracy. Uh, Helen is an associate professor and explores the um, intersection of political theory and participative and action-led forms of research. And Phil is an architect and designer who works with community-led development and engagement. So uh, on to you. Thanks so much, Hannah. I'll um, just show him the screen now. Started at the end there, hang on. Does that work, Phil? Brilliant. Okay. Thank you so much, Hannah. And it's fantastic to be here and part of these discussions today. So um, we're Helen Graham and Phil Bixby, and we've both been involved for many years in community development in different ways. For me, this has come from my work in heritage and for Phil through his work as an architect and his involvement in passive house design and community self-build. And since 2017, we've both been working together on large scale public engagement on two regeneration sites in York, both leading to master plans and subsequent planning applications. And through these projects, which are called My Castle Gateway and My York Central, we're interested in innovating in and experimenting with the everyday practices of public engagement and link this to democratic innovation in terms of local democracy more generally. So in the design of our public engagement, we broadly seek to link three kind of main approaches which kind of interlink and overlap. Firstly, the creative expression of what people feel is important. So using community heritage approaches and other approaches to that. Secondly, the exploration and deliberation of complex issues. And then thirdly, seeing changes happening at all scales, whether that's through large scale kind of intervention and planning, um, but also through community action of different sorts. So we're currently exploring how to link, link systemic thinking and deliberative systems theory from political theory to articulate both how we might connect issues, ideas and people, and how we might also connect participatory and action-led forms with representational forms of democracy. But today we want to raise specific questions about the planning for future white paper and in particular how public engagement is imagined within that white paper and suggest an alternative way of articulating public engagement for any new planning system. So the planning for the future white paper is motivated to address the issue that broader strategy, um, specifically around house building, but perhaps more generally as well, whether set nationally or locally, often gets thwarted by local opposition and planning disputes of different kinds, which happen really as a result of strategy making and local development control becoming separated. The white paper suggests that local authorities should radically and profoundly reinvent the ambition, depth and breadth with which they engage communities as they consult with local plans. And this should happen through a shift to move democracy forward in the planning process and give neighbourhoods and communities an earlier and more meaningful voice in the future of their area. So in the white paper, this is framed through a simplification of the local plan process. Um, so in terms of how that happens, communities are imagined as having a meaningful voice through two sites of intervention in that process. The first is about defining land under the three categories of growth, renewal and protected. So neighbourhood plans can potentially shift to reflect these proposals and the scale of the neighbourhood work at different scales. So this could happen right down to street level. It says, for example, very small areas such as individual streets can set their own rules for the development which they're happy to see. The second is through design codes, rules for design which are prepared locally based on genuine community involvement and based on empirical evidence of what is popular and characteristic in the area and it's characterized as a fast track for beauty. In terms of when communities are imagined as being able to influence this process it's at two stages. The first is stage one which is the local plan development and the next is stage three of the local plan in terms of offering comments on the emerging plan. So let's unpick that a bit. So firstly, uh, early involvement. Um, yes, but needs to be ongoing. So we feel that early involvement and commitment to more ambitious approaches to public engagement is absolutely positive and is definitely crucial. 
but you knew there was going to be a but. The conversation is limited by the pre-formatted categories of protection, renewal, and growth, and that conceptually constrains that growth. It's conceptually constrained within an economic uh, growth model and safeguarding a protection paradigm. It's basically about constraining what can happen rather than thinking more widely. Secondly, it's limited in terms of focus on housing and not about making places. Thirdly, there are dangers that this solidifies power in the, with the already articulate and wealthy communities who will be able to argue for protection or constrained development by neighbour plans. And, third, and lastly, it's overall there's a separation of land use from transport and movement, which we feel is counterproductive. The whole process of city planning needs to be more dynamic and more holistic. So instead, we'd argue there's need for a much richer and ongoing conversation about how we want to live together and how planning and design can support this. Starting good, starting early is good, um, but we need to start early with the right questions and with very open questions. And that needs to almost be built upon a background process. I think someone talked earlier about the habit of citizenship, um, which runs permanently rather than just once every five years. The, um, creative and personal articulation of what matters and hopes, um, using an enriched and expanded idea of heritage as collective meaning about place needs to happen. We need to surface and explore complex issues. We need a deliberative process informed by multiple perspectives and different forms of knowledge and expertise to make sure it doesn't get kicked down the road. We need to see changes that make brilliant places as happening at all scales, including a small scale community led um, uh, activity as well as planning interventions. So for example, this is my York Central project that Helen and I both worked on. We began the whole process through um, asking the community to set the agenda by using social media, using the networks we had to ensure that it was based upon what they considered important rather than any pre-established agenda. Events that we ran were hugely varied, but also were co-designed with different groups within the area to explore key issues. So, for example, green space, transport, what housing density actually looked like, all sorts of different people were involved in putting them together. We took a very pluralistic approach to it as it quickly became apparent that the connections between the issues were just as important as the issues themselves. So, for example, talking talking about um, movement and the push for uh, mixed use dense neighborhoods, clearly, but brought out the fact that those two were very kind of in, uh, intricately uh, woven with each other. The whole process led to the production of a vision for the area, an open brief, as we've called it, a term that we now use very often, and also a set of key big ideas, which kind of crystallized the kind of the main themes that ran through that vision of the future. Now, in terms of the change uh, that, that's come out of that, as well as informing the master plan um, for the whole of the, the York Central site, this has led to community-led development through specific organisations being formed. Um, we're working with a project called York Central Co-owned or Yoko, um, looking at doing a mixed-use community neighbourhood, which is community-led within that overall development. So there's a lot of faith in the white paper, as we've already heard, about digital tools and visual approaches such as maps. And we think that both can be useful, but there are dangers. Um, we would argue that there needs, the methods need to deal with the complexity of the issues. And the best way of doing that is through narrative. And if images and maps are produced too early, they can really constrain people's thinking. And maps tend to really be about stuff rather than about lives. And it can kind of reduce these conversations to shuffling blocks around a map rather than thinking really broadly about what matters about that place. Narrative is better at building connections between issues. It's also closest to closer to people's lived experience of being in place. The city isn't a map, it's you know, living in it. Um, and so it allows for a connection between the personal and the collective. So maps are a design tool which can be useful and digital tools absolutely can help. But it's stories and collaborative meaning making that make a difference. So we've used this in all sorts of ways, but one really quick example is how we've used deep storytelling about days in your life and the future on York Central to develop a vision with York Central co-owned. So the design, the design code, um, there's a need to expand ideas of design and heritage beyond aesthetics. The design code uh, as it stands within the, the, the white paper is focused on the way things look and in particular on an idea of beauty. Heritage tends to get reduced to aesthetics and isn't seen as being about meaning and experience and the, the, the more intangible stuff. 
the proposed combination of local plan and design code process uh, is in danger of failing to resolve the most complex issues. And the thing about the complex issues is if you don't resolve them, they get kicked down the road leading against the hopes of the white paper to greater planning contentious and contention and local activism later on in the process. So instead, we would argue that design should be imagined much more broadly and it's not just about aesthetics. The design code could be reimagined as an open brief of the kind that we talked about here, so it can deal with what matters, what people want to be able to do, and articulate the complexities that can then be taken for granted later on in the design process. We'd see this as a way of trusting people as citizens to know their places, after all they make those places every day through living their lives and working there, and produce a really good brief and then trust the designers and planners to use their expertise to respond to the open brief. And here's an example from um, two parts of an open brief that we've done. This is the My Casa Gateway project, um, open brief for the new public spaces. So the open brief that we put together for it um, presents the, the brief as stories of what might happen there based upon bringing together what people said they wanted to do there. And we then sought to resolve the complex issues which came out of the, the, those narratives in advance and express them in a way which designers could then respond to. So there are dangers in the white paper that the very positive desire to do early public engagement will ultimately simply turn into um, things being done to communities later on and kind of worse in their name. Um, so we need a much broader vision of ongoing change and for communities role in making and changing their places in an ongoing way. Places are made through everyday actions and activity as well as through planning and developments and large scale interventions. And there needs to be a closer and more dynamic relationship between the two. So we sort of see there should be an ongoing requirement for developers to engage with evolving local action, how places continue to evolve and a reimagination of local democracy as a totality of these different types of decision making and action. So a quick example from my castle gateway, it's led to a master plan and there will be large scale interventions and infrastructure, such as a new bridge. But this also led um, to a group of people who were inspired by the fact that the eye of Yorkshire, Yorkshire was a place where Yorkshire MPs were elected before the Great Reform Act. And they've set up a speaker's corner where you know, democratic dialogue can happen on a monthly basis. So the key thing there is that places evolve after master plans have been approved through community activity. And these changes need to be taken into account as development ideas turn into action on the ground. So some final thoughts. Um, to return to the key aspiration, the white paper says, local councils should radically and profoundly reinvent the ambition, depth and breadth in which they engage with communities they consult on local plans. And we would absolutely support this, but it will not be enabled by the way public engagement is imagined in the white paper. So our key points about the intervention have been, firstly, yes, early and ongoing public involvement, an ongoing process actively facilitated to include lots of different people who might come and go, but contribute to a rolling model of issues and connections. Secondly, plan through narrative and collaborative meaning making, using all kinds of means of communication, using expanded idea of heritage to explore what matters in a collaborative inquiry in our places and their connections. Thirdly, think of design in an expanded sense. It's not just about aesthetics, the way things look, or any kind of imagined view of what beauty might be. It's based on use and functional placemaking, and it should encourage design professionals to respond to that with joy, with humor and creativity. We should think of change as a collaborative endeavor. It connects everyday action, community-led initiatives, government and private-led development. And there probably needs to be funding to enable communities to reflect and influence as well as simply do what they do. And we see this all, all the points we've made as being best articulated with an expanding vision for planning within local democracy via sort of systemic thinking and deliberative systems. Deliberative systems that connect everyday talk, community led action with empowered decision making through formal processes, going where people are, whether that's pubs, places of worship, skateboard parks, to meet people on their own terms and linking up people and perspectives that are not usually heard in public sphere conversations. Deliberation, not assertion. So instead of this kind of have your say cliche of consultation, um, which leads to untested assertion, 
What we're interested in is drawing people into an informed and creative conversation, one that can, through multiple perspectives, make visible and deal with complexity and systemic effects. And finally, a responsive approach to enabling and facilitating change at all scales. So recognizing large scale public investment, private investment and development, but also community led action, everyday action, and ensuring that developers who are in active and ongoing dialogue with people who are in those places as they evolve. So I guess our final thoughts, we've got a couple of final thoughts, um, is there are kernels of good ideas in the white paper, but it does need a different framework and different practices of public engagement to realise its stated democratic intentions. And specifically, it needs a different understanding of the potential of citizen engagement to think and envision beyond the way planning is conceived. Otherwise, cities will always struggle to keep pace with the lives of the people that live there, let alone unlock their imagined futures. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so, so much for that. I thought it was in, it, it was an incredible discussion about deliberative systems. And, and um, But I think one of my questions, which um, I suppose was touched on, but this idea of, um, uh, Phil, your, your work with My Future with York and, and what the discussion about how to kind of get these citizen assemblies and so on and, and have their voices heard. Um, how and 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 you mentioned bringing it into um bringing it systemically into let's say uh policy and so on so what what would some sort of areas of opportunities or interventions be for scaling this up how would how is this something that actually could be part of this rule-based approach uh bearing in mind things like um resource uh uh, the, you know, barriers and, and capacity and so on, what would you say is, is needed? I'd, I'd kick off by saying a couple of things in terms of citizens assemblies and bodies like that, we're very, very nervous about ideas around representative democracy. The reason for the, for the my in my future or whatever else is about aggregating the individual experience and individual views of the future. So I think that's kind of a key point. So it's about finding ways of connecting um, from street level discussion right the way through to policy making, um, which is a complex business and it's something you don't do from the standing start, but it's trying to find ways of building that kind of process. Helen. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's the thing about deliberative systems, which is really a big discussion that's happening in political theory at the moment, in that it takes some of the characteristics associated with a deliberative democracy, that is a kind of a chance to explore complex ideas from multiple perspectives in a way that's informed by varieties of ways of knowing and expertise, but expands that beyond the assembly idea or being in the room, which is always going to draw to some extent on various representational logics, whether that's sortition, like we choose people for trials, uh, or whether it's on some kind of idea of demographic representation. And what we're interested in doing, doing really using deliberative systems is take the participatory idea of people being able to get involved on their own terms, but link it in a way that can work at scale. And that's very much why we're using deliberative systems to, re, to you know, frame our work as it develops. And so the purpose of that is absolutely that it can work at scale and that it can combine all sorts of different places in which conversations about the city or about the neighbourhood or the street are happening in ways that ultimately lead to meaningful understanding both of the complex system of the city, because actually in order to understand the complex system of the city, we have to know it from all of those different perspectives and lives that are being lived around the city, but also draw it into a democratic system, which is the deliberative mm -hmm. systems part that can deal with complexity, can in develop informed debate and discussion, and then inform formal decision making, as well as unleash community action through the networks that have been built through those processes. Just picking up on one of the comments from uh, one of the earlier speakers, which I thought was brilliant about the notion of, of planning being fun, planning being satisfying, the notion that you know, thinking about collective futures, if that's one dull planning committee meeting after another, mm -hmm. then we're all doomed to hell. Uh, we need to think of it in different ways. And if we can find ways of making that process of active citizenship, of making engagement with thinking about our future, something which people actively want to be part of, because it is a creative process. I'm fortunate being a designer. I spend all my time having great fun designing things. Everybody can engage with that process if we make it sufficiently accessible. Yeah. Thank you. And um, 
we, we're running out of time, but I'm just going to go over one minute. So I'm going to read both of the questions and if you could kind of just comment quite briefly. But uh, Susan Ashley says, Helen and Phil, uh, how to talk to national government about this, especially since the economic agenda and the social agenda for planning are so different. And Louis Tam um, talks about uh, basically the need for engagement requiring long term commitment and resources. And so in your experience, what are the bi biggest obstacles in achieving those and what might be the resolution? Uh, one minute. <laughs> OK, I'll just you to continue. No, I'll start with national government, Phil, and do you want to do the other one? Yeah. So I think the first thing around national government policy is for their local planning policy to have a better and more expanded idea of public engagement in the way that we've talked about. So I think there's a definite policy intervention here, which responds to some of the intent behind planning for future, but also radically opens up and shows um, practical ways, which I think we've got, um, and lots of people who've been involved in this conversation will have, to, to sustain and structure public, ongoing public involvement within um, placemaking. So I think that's the main intervention that can be made. So there is a shared intent, I think, even if the framing within the white paper is problematic. On the second question about this kind of long-term commitment, I think the interesting thing with this process, is it doesn't necessarily require long-term commitment from individuals or groups or communities. What it does require is long-term commitment from the, if you like, the kind of the people pushing the process forward, which in this case is mainly local authorities. So the two things that needs to them is firstly, breaking down silos so that different departments within local authorities can get involved and can carry the ball between them. And the second um, is moving away from thinking about um, development and planning as a kind of site by site thing and thinking more holistically and realizing that even when you've got the next couple of years worth of kind of immediate train crashes sorted out, you've really got to start thinking about 10 years and 20 years. So really practically, when Phil, Phil talks about breaking down silos, local authorities are out there having conversations with people of all backgrounds and all experiences all the time. And we're working currently with, um, we're in dialogues, we're in discussions with your um, uh, local area coordinators, for example, who are doing a lot of this asset-based community development work within the city, um, and how this, these conversations that are happening anyway can then become a meaningful part of designing a deliberative system at city scale. Thank you so, so much. We're going to have to stop it there, but do um, do continue the conversation uh, in the in the questions box. Um, thanks. Thanks. Uh, Anna. It's, it's something you. that I'm so interested in. Okay.